All right, so when the temperature rises, things heat up. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me go ahead and get the sign-in sheet passed around. Uh, I think it's okay with you. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about um, where we uh, left off and where we're headed. So um, we spent the last lecture uh, looking at problems that are indeterminate. In other words, problems where the uh, number of uh, unknowns exceeds our number of available equations of equilibrium. Uh, let me turn my phone down. It's not disturbing lecture. Okay, so um, in order to solve problems like this, we have to utilize what are known as compatibility relationships. And that's the idea that not only do we have to satisfy equilibrium, but we have to satisfy the idea that the deformations must go along with one another for given members. So um, an easy way of uh, describing that was looking at, um, at this example where we had a composite column. This is a, uh, a problem that deals with an internally indeterminate structure. We have a single member, so we can you know, you know, easily find external reactions. That wasn't the problem. The problem is that that one member has two unknown forces. It has the force in the uh, aluminum and the brass. It was a brass core. So <coughs> we recognize that in order to solve this problem, we needed an additional uh, equation of equilibrium, or uh, not equation of equilibrium, but an equation of compatibility. So we recognize that if we take this column and we push down on it, we recognize that however much the aluminum squishes or contracts or compre uh, undergoes compression, the brass will undergo the same displacement. So our, our second equation, our equation of compatibility, was that the displacement uh, of the aluminum was equal to the displacement of the brass, and that's how we solved the problem. And we did something very similar for this problem as well. The idea that we had this um, rigid bar uh, being supported by two, or this rigid beam uh, supported by two deformable bars, one made of steel, uh, one made of bronze. Um, we, we recognized that that bar would, uh, or that beam would deflect in a linear fashion. So we used compatibility relationships to recognize that um, the steel and the bronze, they wouldn't deform to the same degree, they wouldn't have the same deformation, but they would be proportional based on the geometry of the problem. So, and then we went through and did all that. Did anybody have any questions about those indeterminate problems or anything like that? Did all that make sense? Okay, <coughs> so when objects heat up, they expand. When objects cool down, they contract. Now, I figure I, I probably ought to stick to reading the slide, you know. I'm not one of those guys that just stands there and reads the slides, but maybe this time I ought to. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, what we're talking about now is sort of a, it's an important topic, but it's a topic that's a little bit on the side uh, of axially loaded members. So for axially loaded members, we'll deal with thermal effects. When we deal with torsionally loaded members, things that are twisted, we'll deal with another topic on the side, and that's power-torque relationships, trying to transfer power to, uh, to machines and what have you for you uh, mechanical folks. That'll be kind of important. Um, we talked about this last time, um, the idea um, that uh, temperature variations can cause deformation, just like if you took a uh, uh, an inflated balloon and you threw it in the fridge or you took an inflated balloon and you heated it up, its volume is going to change. The same thing happens here. Specifically what happens thermally, if we're talking about solids, you know, with the balloon we're talking about, you know, fluid mechanics, looking at, at a gas. Um, with a solid, what happens is uh, when, you, when a, an object undergoes a temperature variation, a change in temperature, it produces a strain, an, a an axial strain. Um, actually, it's a sort of strain in all directions, but for the purposes of what we're talking about, we're really only considering elongation and contraction. Now, if you all remember, um, if we ignore uh, thermal effects, there, there are certain uh, properties or constants that define material behavior. For instance, let's take steel. If I take a piece of steel and I apply a load to it, it responds by deforming. There is a relationship between that applied stress and that resulting strain in the linear range, and we call that Young's modulus, right? That E value. You know, for steel, it's like E equals like 29,000 KSI or 30,000 KSI, depending upon your grade of steel or what have you. Okay. Just like E, E being a material property for, uh, for steel, 
This term alpha is also a material property for given materials. Alpha stands for the coefficient of thermal expansion. And there's different alpha values for steel, for, for copper, for you know, brass, for aluminum. They're, they're all listed. You can go to your textbook. Uh, uh, they're in Appendix I. You'll find all of the uh, uh, alpha, or at least reasonable uh, alpha values for a number of materials. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting, uh, and this is a, a civil engineering example, but, you know, forgive me, I'm a civil engineer, so I relate to a lot of my stuff through that. Um, one of the things about reinforced concrete is, if you, is that you've got a material, you've got a composite uh, uh, system. You've got concrete and steel behaving together. Okay, so one thing that might or potentially could be a little bit of a problem is what happens if you take a member that's comprised of reinforced concrete and you heat it up or you cool it down. Well, yeah, w when things heat up, they expand. But if you've got two different materials, couldn't they expand at different rates? That could be a problem, right? One of the nice things about reinforced concrete is that the alpha values for concrete and steel are, by and large, pretty close together. So they, they kind of expand and contract around the same rate. It's actually, it's actually pretty nifty. Um, now, um, here recently there's been advances in the world of reinforced concrete, and one of the things that has been tried out is the idea of using reinforcement that is not steel. Um, one particular type of material is known as uh, FRP, or fiber reinforced polymers. It's, it's kind of like, imagine if you took fiberglass and heated it past the glass transition point. It sort of turns into this like rigid fibrous material. That's kind of what FRP is. It's got the strength, but sometimes there's some issues using it. One of the issues is that it has a different alpha value than concrete. So if you heat it up, it expands at a different rate, and you can get a lot of debonding. So. Random, you know, useless trivia, but you know. Do yes. they take like fragments of that and put them in concrete that are reinforced? They do that, yes. Um, they, they, they. Uh, that's one thing they do. There's also a relatively new class of um, concrete called ultra high performance concrete, uh, or UHPC. I've actually done a, a little bit of research on it, and the the proportioning and the mixing of it is very controlled and very unique. But they basically take steel fibers and shake it into the mix. They they're akin to, it's almost like they're akin to sewing needles, but they're a little, little shorter. They're just these like little fibers that you shake into the mix. But to give you an idea of its strength, um, one of the fundamental properties uh, of concrete that we use in our, um, in our designs, and you'll learn this when you take reinforced concrete design, you'll learn this when you take Professor Huffman for civil engineering materials, is a concrete's compressive strength. In other words, we take a sample of concrete uh, a cylinder, remember when we talked about stress strain uh, uh, properties that for concrete we had these compression cylinders, we load it to failure and we record its maximum stress that it achieved and we call that its compressive strength. Now typical normal run of the mill concrete gets around 4,000 PSI. This ultra high performance concrete that I was mentioning, around 22,000 PSI. So this stuff is strong. It's also pretty expensive, so you only use it in very specific circumstances. Um, like if you've got a bridge module and another bridge module and you want to join them with a closure floor. That'd be a, an instance of UHPC. So. This is good stuff. I like this. Anybody have any other questions? I mean, all right, okay. All right, so like I said, um, thermal strain and, and, uh, and change in temperature are related by this alpha value. Alpha is a material characteristic. You're going to have a different alpha value for bronze than you are for copper, than you are for steel, what have you. Now, we mentioned this last time, and this is an important point to mention, that um, if, if I have just a, a, a block of steel right here, and I heat it up, and it's just sitting on the table, it's going to expand, which means it's going to generate a thermal strain. Okay. Is it going to generate a thermal stress? No. Okay. If it's just sitting there, it's just going to expand. The thermal stress would be zero. Okay. However, if I did something like this, if I took a bar and I locked it between two supports and I heated it up, what's going to happen? That bar is going to want to you know, expand and the wall is holding it back. So if I heated that bar up, what's that bar going to experience? Contention or compression? Think, all right, well, okay. Think, think, if you heated it up, the bar is going to want to expand 
the walls are keeping it in, so it's, it's being compressed. On the flip side, if I took that bar and I cooled it down, it would be in tension. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So, to, uh, just, so th these formulas here, just to try and clarify a couple things. So first off, delta T, the deformation due to uh, thermal effects. Well, if the strain is uh, alpha T times L, I mean, what is strain? It's the change in length over the original length. So just take the strain, multiply it by the length, and there you go. There's your total displacement. As for the stress, just E times the strain. Again, assuming you have some level of restraint. Okay. <laughs> We're probably not going to use some of these directly. We're going to do it a little differently, but you'll, you'll see what happens here in a second. Now, one of the other things I'll point out is that these formulas are if we have a constant temperature variation. You know, we just take the whole bar and we heat it up 50 degrees or whatever. But if we have a, a, a change in temperature uh, distribution, in other words, one side of the bar is getting hotter than another, um, which is very possible uh, in, our, in our crazy engineering world, then we've got to use a little bit of integration. Okay? So basically, we would be doing something similar to what we did with mechanical stresses. Remember when we had varying load or varying area we had to integrate? If we have a varying change in temperature, you know, one side of the bar getting hotter than another, we have to integrate there. The only time we don't have to integrate is if we have a constant temperature. Okay? Make sense? All right. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this example and try and explain what's going on. So I got a steel bar and it's sandwiched between these two walls on, on each side. Now the bar is 100 inches long. The cross-sectional area is two square inches. I've given you a modulus of elasticity and I've given you a coefficient of thermal expansion. Now look at the units, okay? It says the units are degrees Fahrenheit to the negative one. So it's kind of like, um, you know how hertz are one per second? This is one per degrees Fahrenheit because what am I going to do with that? I'm going to take that alpha and multiply it by a change in temperature. So one per degree Fahrenheit times a change in temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is going to yield no units. And strain is no units. Remember, it's inches per inch or millimeters per millimeter. So that's why our units come out like that. Okay? Now, if the load on the rod is, uh, um, is zero at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so in other words, when it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit, we took that bar and we stuck it between those two walls, we secured it between those two walls, tell me what happens to the bar, tell me what the stress in that bar is when the temperature drops to zero degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? So this bar got colder. Okay? So ultimately that means that bar is going to be experiencing tension when it's all said and done, right? Make sense? Okay, now let's see how we would do that. Let's see how we'd go about computing that. This is actually a pretty basic problem when, when, when you get right down to it. The only other point I would make is this. This problem, while it may not look like it, this problem is one that is statically indeterminate. Okay? This is an indeterminate problem. Because let's ignore the, the temperature stuff for a second. Let's assume I'm taking this bar and either pulling it or pushing it or applying an axial load. If I look at equilibrium, and if I say sum of forces in the x direction has to equal zero, I've got whatever loads I'm applying to it that I know, but I've got two unknown reactions. So I've got a reaction at this wall and a reaction at this wall. So I've got two unknowns, but I really only have one equation of equilibrium. So this is an indeterminate structure. Okay? Yes, sir? Not necessarily. That's a good question. Not necessarily. I'll say this. In a thermal problem, I'll, I'll buy that, assuming you have constant temperature variation, but not if you've got loads applied, a and if those loads are at different places. Okay? That's a, that's a good question. All right. But as soon as, they, as soon as symmetry goes out the window, then that assumption goes out the window as well. All right. So far, so good? Okay. Example 9. Is this thing recording? Okay. All right, so let's write down a couple just given parameters, just to make sure we're, we're clear on what's going on. All right, 
So we know that the length of this member is what, 100 inches? We know that E is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI, right? Okay. We know that the area is 2 inches squared. We know that alpha is 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6, all right, um, 1 per degrees Fahrenheit. See what I'm doing there? Now, what I'm going to do for delta T is I'm going to say delta T is negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, you know, if you want, you can write cooling. I'd argue that the negative sign doesn't really matter as long as you're understanding the, the physical implications or impl implications. Ugh. All right. Okay, now one thing I do want to do is draw the original problem. So here's the original problem. And this is L equals 100 inches. All right, so far so good? Okay, all right. So here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce you real quick um, to a, a class of structural analysis techniques uh, called flexibility methods. Uh, and that is a really fancy term for, for what I'm about to show you, but the long and short of it is, is trying to uh, solve for unknown forces when you've got an indeterminate problem. Okay. Now, do we recognize that this is, I guess, theoretically an indeterminate problem, the idea that you know, if I yank on it, I've got too many unknowns, then I do equations of equilibrium. Everybody okay with that? Now, here's what I'm going to do. This is where the indeterminate analysis comes into play. Let's assume one wall is free. Okay? In other words, Let's take that right support, let's get rid of it. Let's just assume it's gone, and that's our problem, all right? Okay, so far so good? Now, if I take this bar and I apply this delta T to it, what's it going to do? It's going to get colder, right? It's, but I'm talking about in terms of its length. Is it going to get longer or is it going to get shorter? It's going to get shorter, okay? So if I take this wall and I knock it off and I apply that temperature variation, what's going to happen is this. I'm going to have, you, know, you can think of this as, uh, this is like before and this is after. That bar is going to do something about like this. See how it got shorter? In other words, you know, here's the, what the bar did there. Now can somebody tell me what this, well I'll tell you what, this dimension right here that's the amount of elongation, or in this case, shortening, all right? This is delta T, all right? In other words, if I knock that support off, it's going to shrink some delta T, okay? Now, this is a constant temperature variation, okay? So, how much is delta T? It's going to be alpha delta T. L, right? The, the strain, which is just this, and if you want, you can say this is going to be, this is the thermal strain times the length. I mean, how do you calculate strain? 
change in length over the original length. So if I take the strain, multiply it by the length, that gives me the change, and that's what I'm after. So plug and chug. And again, this is where units come into play. Make sure you're paying attention. So, excuse me, 6.5 times 10 to the minus 6, 1 per degree Fahrenheit times minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit times the 100 inches. So before I do any grunt work on the calculator, what are the units going to come out to be? Inches, which is what I'm after. I'm after, for how, I'm after how much this bar is expanding or contracting. I want a dimension, a number. All right, makes sense? Bless you. So what does that come out to be? And it'll be a small number. All right. So far, so good? Okay. So, here, here's the nifty part uh, to this problem. Okay. So, if I knock that wall off the, off the side and I apply that temperature variation, it's going to shrink um, about 0.455 inches. Okay. But in reality, that wall is really there. So, what I need to find out is, is the following. I need to find out how much mechanical force it would take to pull that rod back to zero, right? And if I figure that out, that's going to be the reaction at this end of the rod. Does that make sense? So that's where the indeterminate stuff comes into play. So here's my, you know, here's my, uh, my thermal expansion. What I'm now going to do is I'm now going to be dealing with, I guess, a whole new different problem. So, does everybody have this? Okay, so, all right. So, what I'm going to say is wall reaction. And what do I mean? Okay, I need to pull that rod back to zero. So, that means I need to achieve a deflection of. 0 0.0455 inches. I have a member that's 100 inches long. I have an E value that's 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. I have an area, oh, not delta. I have an area that's 2 square inches. My question is this. If I'm talking about a mechanical force, you know, literally pulling on the bar, I propose to you that delta is PL over EA, right? Right? I mean, uh, we're, right now we're just looking at the mechanical force and there's no uh, variation in uh, uh, area and we're talking about a constant force applied at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this and solve for P. So would you agree that if I rearrange this, I would get EA over L times delta. Would you agree with that? Okay. So that's P is, we got a fraction on the top. We got 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. We got 2.0 square inches. We got 0 0.0455 inches. And we got 100 inches on the bottom. Now let's take a look at our units, make sure everything makes sense. So if I look here on the right, I've got inches and inches, so that cancels. Sorry, I used IN and then the little uh, uh, double apostrophe symbol there, so sorry about that. So inches and inches cancel, and I got PSI times inches squared, so that's going to come out in pounds, and that's what we're looking for, a force. Okay, so what does that come out to be? All right, so I want you, okay, so 27,300 pounds. So let's engage in a thought experiment, okay? So I've got this bar and I've cooled it down. So what I did is I removed that wall, let it cool. It cooled about and caused it to uh, uh, 
shrink about .0455 inches. And then I said, well, in reality, that wall is really there. So how much force would it take to pull that rod back to zero? And that's 27,300 pounds. Does that make sense? So I propose to you that the wall reaction is 27,300 pounds. That's the actual force applied at the end of that bar. That's the force that results from that thermal load. Make sense? So if this is the force, what would the area be? Or not the area, what would the stress be? P over A, well essentially half that, yeah. So 27,300 pounds over that. And what do we get? That should be um, right? 650, yeah, you're right, 650, sorry, 650, get my comma there, all right, 13,650 PSI, I want you to think about that number, what's tire pressure in your car, 40 PSI, that's 13,000 PSI, okay, and that resulted from taking a piece of steel and changing its temperature by 70 degrees. That's serious stress. You see what I mean? So this, you know, so, some of the, the numbers that we see and the magnitudes they deal with, sometimes you know, it's just kind of amazing the, the, the values that you can get. I mean, this is a very reasonable problem, and this is the type of stress you can get. So just, uh, just worth mentioning. All right. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's it's a um, yeah it's a little indirect though. Th this is really a, a little bit more of a basic approach. I, and I mentioned that earlier that we really probably aren't going to use the stress equation very much, but technically it would work. Like if you got your thermal strain, you could back calculate the thermal stress, assuming that things are restrained. I put it there, but in all actuality, it might be a little misleading at times. So. Does that make sense? All right, everybody good? Okay. Okay, now we got a problem that's a little, uh, a little more involved. Um, it's a determinant problem, so we don't have to deal with the indeterminate analysis portion, but it's a little more involved in, the, uh, 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 in some of the, the, the loads, specifically the thermal load. So let's take a look at this. So I've got a brass bar that is shown subjected to an axial load at the tip. So this is statically determinant because I'm taking it and I'm pulling it with P on the, uh, on the right. I got a P load on the left, right? Okay. Now, so first off, okay, that, uh, that P uh, load, is that making the bar longer or shorter? Longer, okay. Now. Let's, let's skip ahead a little bit. Let's take a look at some of this temperature stuff, and then I'll, I'll go back and define everything one at a time. Okay. So originally, the bar length at 50 degrees is 60 inches. Now, the temperature that's applied is going from 50 uh, here to 150 there. So the bar is, in a way, getting heated up. Does that make sense? Okay. So this mechanical force, this P at the end, this P at the end is making the bar longer, right? The thermal load, is it making the bar longer? Yes, right? So my point is, is that the deflection from that mechanical P at the end and the deflection from that thermal load, we can add them up. You see what I mean? That's where you got to be careful, okay? What if I was taking this bar and yanking on it, but then at the same time I was also making it colder? I can't just take deflection one and add it to deflection two. I got to subtract them. You, you see what I mean? It's all about just you know paying attention to what's going on. Okay, make sense? All right. Now let's go through and, and go through all the details. Make sure we're good. Okay. So we got a brass bar subjected to an axial load at the tip. All right. So the modulus of elasticity is 15 times 10 to the 6 psi. The bar length, undeformed at 50 degrees, is 60 inches. The yield stress. We've we've given we've been given a yield stress of 15,000 psi. So 
we probably won't use that yield stress directly in the problem, but that'll tell us if the rod is behaving linearly or not, okay? Sort of that limiting value before we start getting plastic behavior. We got our alpha value, our coefficient of thermal expansion. We've got a bar diameter of 50 inches, so we've got to do a little bit more work to get the uh, area. Now, this is where the problem gets a little interesting. In addition to P, the bar is heated along its length, and the temperature is found to vary linearly from 50 degrees at the fixed end to 150 degrees at the loaded end. So the bar is gradually getting hotter. All right. Uh, I want to determine the magnitude of P at the end. If this thing can't get longer than 0 0.08 inches, and then let's determine at that load if it's behaving elastically. Make sense? Now, before we begin, I do have one question. So this bar is being heated up. Will it generate a thermal strain? A strain. Strain is that resulting deformation. So yes, it's going to get longer. Will it generate a thermal stress? No, no, it, it's, it's allowed to freely elongate or contract. So we'll get thermal strain, but we won't get thermal stress, okay? And it all goes into what's actually going on with this problem. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, all right. So now let, let, let's start to dissect this problem a little bit. Okay. We're already at example 10, goodness. We are booking it through some of this stuff. Let me know if I, if I gotta slow down and go back and explain something. I mean, I'm, I'm in here for, uh, for, for you all. I'm not in here for me. I mean, if I wanted, I could just go lecture this stuff in the janitor's closet by myself, but, but I'm here to teach you all. So if y'all have any questions, please don't, don't hesitate. All right, okay. So let's start writing down some given parameters. Let's, let's start to define some of these symbols and some of the data that we've been given. So let's see. We should know that our, let's see, our E value, we know that, right? It's, uh, what is it, 15, 15 times 10 to the 6? ESI, all right? We know that L is 60 inches. And I'm going to put here on the side, I'm going to put at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's actually going to make a little bit of sense, or, that, that, or that'll make a little sense why I'm doing that here in a little bit. Um, uh, when we start looking at our temperature variations, it, I, I just want that indicated, okay? Now we've got a, a sigma y of 15,000 PSI, okay? We won't directly use that, but we'll, we'll be able to reference that value to what we get at the very, very end to see whether or not what we're doing is right, okay? So we got alpha, which is that material characteristic. We're dealing with a different material in this problem, so we've got a different alpha. Same thing with E, we got a different E. And again, alphas tend to be very small, so it's like times 10 to the negative 6, so point zero 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 zero, zero you know, that, 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 and that's fine, okay? We've got a uh, diameter, what the heck? The diameter of the bar of 0 0.5 inches. So what can we do with that? Why does that matter? The area. the area, right? So we say, all right, the area is pi over 4 d bar squared, which is pi over 4 times 0 0.50 inches squared. So if this was made out of steel, it almost be like this is a piece of number four rebar, but it's not made out of steel. So that comes out to be uh, something like 196. All right. Excuse me. Now, we know that uh, delta allowable is 0 0.08 inches, and what we're trying to find is P, right? That's our big goal. All right, make sense? All right, so far so good? Okay, all right. Now, let's look at this temperature variation, because that's sort of the, 
the maybe the quirkiest part of this problem is that temp uh, temperature variation. So temperature effects. All right. So I like pictures, so let, let's draw some pictures. So. Okay, so let's think of this like it was a big coordinate system. So if you would, you know, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, or if you want to look at it like that. Really what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is the, uh, uh, if, uh, on the uh, horizontal axis it's x, on the y-axis I'm going to say it's temperature. Okay, so, so bear with me. Um, here at the left side of the bar, what is x equal? zero, right? Here it would be x equals L or x equals 100 or how, however you want to do it. it. It really doesn't matter. I'm probably going to leave it in symbols for, for what we're about to do, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, now what's the temperature right uh, here on the left side? 50 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, what is the temperature over here? 150. Now, so that is what the temperature looks like, okay? So if we wanted to graph that, it might look something kind of like this. Like, let me draw this down a little bit. X, T. It might look something like this. Like, this is 50, and that's 150, right? Make sense? Okay, now, this is where you got to be a little careful with, with the... The, what was documented, and I want to go back to this up here, this length, okay? The undeformed length of the bar at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So at the very beginning of this problem, before we started heating it up, the temperature was 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is what I want to point out. What I've graphed over here is the temperature, but what I really want to know is the change in temperature. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Here, let me sort of draw that to kind of see where I'm, where I'm going here. Okay, let's look at the very beginning of the bar, or the, the left side of the bar. The temperature at the left side of the bar is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. What was the original temperature? 50. So over here, what's the change in temperature? Zero. So here... X equals zero, delta T equals zero. What about on the on the right side? The X equals L. What does delta T equal? A hundred. So, like that. That's our change in temperature, right? So this right here, this would be delta T of X. Does that make sense? Make sense? Any questions? All right. All right. So this is kind of like an equation of a line. You know, y equals mx plus b. So how do we go about that? All right. At x equals 0, delta t equals 0. At x equals l, delta t equals some value, okay, I'm, I'm going to call it this. I'm going to call it delta T2, the, the delta T at the right end. Now, this delta T2, this is really the 100. That's where I'm getting this, okay, the 100 degrees. But I'm going to keep everything symbolic because I actually think it makes the integration a little easier to follow, all right? So what do we got? We got the slope of that line as the change in Y over the change uh, in X right, which is delta T 2 over L, and then what's the y-intercept? Zero. It's just going right through the origin. So I propose to you that delta T of X is delta T 2 over L times X. All right. I'll give you all a second if you need to write that down.
Does that make sense? If you want, you can say this is delta T1, that's delta T2, the little blue there and there. Any questions? Can we leave this up here for a little bit? I see a couple folks still writing, so I'll wait. Everybody good? Okay, all right. So I'm going to switch over. Next panel. Okay, why does that matter? Okay, because I propose that going back to those temperature effects, so I'll say temperature effects, continued. I propose that the change in length due to those thermal effects, if you want to write out thermal, that's fine, is the following. I propose that it is the integral from x equals 0 to x equals L of alpha delta T dx. Now, why am I integrating? I don't throw calculus in just because I enjoy it. There has to be a reason. Okay. The alpha is a constant, so we can factor that out. The delta T is not. Okay. The delta T is what we just determined. So that is, I'll go ahead and leave that in for now, that alpha, because you'll see what I do. It is alpha times delta T2 over L times X dx. All right. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. What happens to the uh, origin zero stuff? We're not there. We're only doing the thermal stuff now. You're, you're talking about the, the, that P at the end? We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, what we're doing now is we're going to handle them one at a time. That's what I was mentioning earlier where, you know, the temperature is going to heat the bar up so it's going to get longer. The mechanical load is going to make the bar longer, or go like this, so it's going to make the bar get longer. So we're going to add those deflections up, but I'm handling them one at a time. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 okay, okay, no, that's a good, that's a good question. Okay, so what I'm doing is this, all right? Let me do this, okay? So just to clear it up, so I got this integral from right here, but maybe a better way of writing that, if you want, I could do this. I could say delta mechanical is just the integral of what we've seen before of the N over the EA dx, and then the delta thermal See what I've got going on? So this would be the integral for the mechanical loads. This would be the integral for the thermal loads, and I would just be adding them up. Right now, all I'm doing is the thermal expression. And see, again, going, going back to another point, uh, uh, what I said earlier, I only use calculus when I need to. The temperature is what's varying, so I've got to integrate. The mechanical loads don't. It's just P at the end. It's just a constant P across. I don't need to do any calculus for the mechanical loads. Make sense? Okay, that, that's a good question. Is that, that clear? Everybody else? Okay. All right, so, all right, so going back to this, let's see if we can knock this out. All right, so everything is a constant here but the x, because the delta T2, that's that change in temperature, the 100 degrees at the very end. The length is a constant and the alpha is a constant. So. I can say alpha delta T2 over L times the integral from X equals 0 to X equals L of X dx. What's the integral of X? There we go.
It might seem a little superfluous to be writing you know, the x equals 0 and the x equals L, but I like to do that just so we know this is the variable. X is the variable. So I, I'm, I'm probably um, being a little notation happy, but I'd rather do that than, uh, uh, than be confused later on. So how, how do I do this definite integral? Plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number. If I plug in the bottom number, that's just going to be 0. So I've got alpha delta t2 over L times L squared over 2, right? What's going to happen to one of them L's? Going to cancel. So I've got uh, alpha delta t2 L over 2, okay? So in other words, heating that bar up, you know, not just applying a constant 100 degrees, but saying, you know, we're going to gradually heat it up is going to lengthen it this amount. Now let's plug in some numbers and let's see what we get. Okay, So therefore delta thermal is alpha. What's alpha? There we go. 10.6 times 10 to the negative 6, 1 per degree Fahrenheit. Delta T2 is what? The 100. And that's where it can be a little confusing and you've got to make sure to pay attention. If you're just doing the problem, you might be tempted to say it's 150 because it's 150 degrees at the end. No, it's 100. All right. The length is 100 inches. See, oh, I'm, see, there you go. I'm thinking of the other problem. All right, 60. Divided by 2. And what do we get? There we go. That seconded. Make sense? Okay, so far so good? So that temperature variation is going to lengthen this bar by about 0.03 inches. What is the maximum allowable deflection? 0.08. So we got a little bit of wiggle room with that mechanical load. That mechanical load still can yank on it a little bit. We got to figure out what's the maximum allowable mechanical load before we reach that 0.08. Make sense? So, and, and this is where, you know, your signs, you know, you need to make sure you're cognizant of that. Remember, the mechanical load is going to make it longer. The thermal load is also going to make it longer. So make sure you're adding appropriately. So I propose to you the following. Um, uh, Actually, can I go ahead and go on to the next slide? All right. Okay. I propose to you that if we're looking at the mechanical effects, when I say that, I'm talking about that actual physical force we're applying. I propose that whatever the mechanical deflection plus that thermal deflection that we just computed, Whatever that mechanical deflection plus that thermal deflection happens to be, that's got to be less than or equal to delta allowable, right? Make sense? All right. So if I subtract that over, I've got delta mechanical has, um, has got to be less than or equal to delta allowable minus delta thermal, right? Make sense? Okay. All right. Now, if we want, we can go ahead and say delta mechanical whoop, has got to be less than or equal to 0 0.08 inches minus 0 0.0318. What's that come out to be? 482? All right. Make sense? And again, the big thing, I just sort of said, oh, it's just delta mechanical plus delta thermal. That's because they're both doing the same thing. They're both making the bar longer. Okay. Now, this delta mechanical, how do I compute delta mechanical? Well, that's PL over EA, right? That's got to be less than or equal to that 0 0.0482, right? 
And what am I trying to find? I'm trying to find P, right? So I need to flip and multiply. So I propose that P has got to be less than or equal to 0 0.0482 times EA over L. Yes? Okay, that, that, all right, that's a good question. All right. So you're, are you talking about the Poisson effect? Yes. Okay, if that's the case, all right, that, that's a good question. All right. Um, I can't draw that. I'm not that good of an artist. So I'm going to have to pull up my little picture. Okay. So what uh, Austin's asking about is don't you have to integrate it since the area is changing because of the Poisson effect? If I take this bar and I make it longer, doesn't the area change? True. But the area changes the same amount everywhere. I mean, imagine if I just pause this at any random point and then cut a section. It's the same area everywhere. But that's not to say that's not happening. Yeah, it is happening. Okay? Make sense? It's just not affecting what we're talking about with this. But that's a, that's a great point to make, right? Are they good? I, I'm not that good of an artist. I can't do that, so. Okay. All right. So if P has to be less than or equal to all that junk on the right, would you agree that P max is just all that stuff on the right? Is that a fair assumption to make? Okay, all right. So that's a big fraction. We got 0 0.0482. E is what? Times 10 to the 6. What was area? It wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, given. We had to calculate, right? 196, not 0, yeah. And the length is 60 inches. So P max is what? Twenty three sixty one point eight. What's the units? Pounds. And that's seconded? Yep. All right. So I'll say that's the answer to part A. In other words, part A was asking, what's the maximum allowable load? And that's the maximum load we can put on that to get that total deflection of 0.08 inches. Make sense? Okay. Now, what was the second question? Is it behaving elastically? Okay, so how would we determine if it's behaving elastically? We look at the yield stress and we compare it against what's the stress. So what is the stress? How do we calculate the stress? P over A. Do we get any thermal stress? No, it's allowed to freely expand. So no thermal stress. So part B, we just take sigma equals P over A and that's it. Okay. Well, yeah, but doesn't it say at that at that load? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. But it's at that load, is it behaving elastically? So um, just because I don't feel like squunching it, I'm going to go ahead and skip on over. I'll say elastic behavior. So sigma is P over A, um, which is... 2361.8 pounds over 0. Point, what was it 196 196 inches squared and that comes out to be what 12050 oh, there we go that's good enough 
So what does that mean? Well, hold on, let's go back to this. What's sigma y? 15,000. So what does that mean? We're still in, in linear behavior, so it's behaving elastically. So I'll say elastic behavior. Now, depending upon your chosen factor of safety, that might not be acceptable. But if you had a factor of safety of two, would that be good? No. So. So yeah. All right. Does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? Because I guess this kind of ends module two. You know, we took for, the first thing that we did was we learned about just fundamental properties of stress and strain, and then we started applying it with our first type of applied problem, which was an axially loaded member. And now we're going to switch into our next topic, which is a torsionally loaded member. Now, um, since it's that time, I have a present. This is when everybody starts thinking about dropping my course evals at the end of the semester. Next Thursday, yes. Um, I've, 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 what I've done is on uh, the last two problems, I've tried to put some hints, but these hints, I'll, I'll say this, the long and short of it is these hints are related to example nine, where we you know, imagined that wall was gone, and then we said, you know, what's the force that would be required to pull it back? Everybody get one? Everybody get one? Okay, so that's due next Thursday. I do want to spend a little bit of time at least talking about or at least mentioning this whole concept of torsion. I mean, we're going to hit it in some very significant detail you know, on Tuesday, but torsion's really nifty, okay? Um, and it's really nifty um, because of what I'm about to show you, okay? And I, I, just, I just have to do this because I think it's, it's worth mentioning. So what we're going to be talking about is a new type of loading, okay? Instead of taking a bar and yanking on it or pushing on it, we're going to take a bar and twist it, okay? Now, it might seem like a little bit of a jump, like we're talking about yanking on stuff, and now you're talking about twisting, like why the jump, okay? Here's the reason, okay? For axial loads... We have delta equals PL over EA, okay? Now, I want to dissect these, okay? Watch this. What is this? This is the deformation, right? Right? What is this? This is the load, right? What is this? This is a material property, right? What is this? This is a section property, right? Make sense? Okay. When we look at torsion, our fundamental equation is ultimately going to look like this. All right? This angle of twist, it's just that. It's, it's the angle. So if I take this section and I twist it, it's all about determining that change in angle. So this is the deformation. This is that applied torque. That's the load. This is the shear modulus, like Young's, Young's modulus. It's a material property. J, which we're going to learn about later, J is a section property. 
And note, we've also got length. It's the same, you know, member length and member length. So axial loads and torsion, they really go well together in terms of their, their mechanics, which is why it's very typical right after you talk about axial loads to go on and talk about torsion, okay? So that's why our first exam is going to be on fundamental, you know, stress and strain, axial loads, and then torsion. Now, I do want to at least introduce a couple, uh, a few more details before we call it for the day. I, I'm, I think I'm probably going to end it a little early because I don't want to take a nosedive into torsion because we're not going to have time to finish it. But um, I do want to at least introduce a couple things to you, okay? So let's talk a little bit about all this. So torsionally loaded shafts, okay? Now, one of the things that you see here is circular shafts, okay? I will never, in this course, give you a torsion problem on a bar that's not circular, okay? Torsion problems will always be circular for a number of reasons. Number one, just because of their mechanics, if you're a, an engineer and you're designing something that's going to be subjected to torsion, and that's what it's meant to do is resist torsion, you're going to select something circular anyways for a very specific reason, okay? So we're talking about, about torsion, all right? This is the reason why we don't deal with um, uh, non-circular sections uh, in this course. So um, one of the things about torsion, and it's just, it just is what it is in, in terms of the, the mechanics and the way things behave, Things that are non-circular behave a little differently uh, under torsion than things that are. Now, when I say circular, I mean solid shafts, I mean pipes, they're all the same. But when it's non-circular, it's a little different. Non-circular sections experience not only an angle change, but they actually deform in and out of the plane. Like if I take this square section and I twist it, not only does it rotate, but it actually deforms in and out a little bit. Okay. We call that deformation warping, okay? And when you're dealing with something that's non-circular, you have to be able to assess its warping capacity. And warping, that, that, that's a little complicated. We gotta take our time to do that. The only time that, I guess, at an undergraduate level that um, we are ever exposed to warping is in steel design. Because when we're dealing with uh, I-beams that are uh, undergoing bending, you know, beams, uh, go back to basic mechanics, the top of the beam's in compression, the bottom of the, beam, the bottom of the beam's in tension. Things in compression like to buckle, they like to lose their stability. And when you have something in, in compression, like with a beam, you have part of the beam that's in compression, part of the beam's in tension, there's kind of this internal conflict going on between uh, what the beam wants to do. Part of it wants to buckle, part of it doesn't. And steel beams undergo a failure called lateral torsional buckling. That, under this magical load, which we talk about that you know, in steel design, they sort of want to kick out and twist. Now, because an I-beam isn't circular, you have to talk about warping to be able to understand what's going on. So it's a little tough. But at least for, for civil engineers, uh, when it comes to torsion, we have one very clear strategy. We like to avoid it. We don't like to. <laughs> I, it's just the honest truth. Stru structural engineers and civil engineers, we like to avoid torsion as much as we can. For you mechanical engineers, you're going to see it. But when you see it, because of its behavior, if you've got something that's going to be subjected to torsion, you're going to want to design it to be circular. Because imagine if you've got this shaft bolted to some plate or some component or what have you, and you twist it and it's not circular. It's going to want to mash into that, that section a little bit. So if you're designing some camshaft or some engine component or what have you and it's subjected to torsion, the torsional resisting component, you're going to want it to be circular anyways. The mechanics are, are, are pretty straightforward uh, in that regard. Now I'll, I'll just uh, forewarn you, and we'll dig into this next time, the mechanics that we get into are a little, I mean, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, just, you know, just tell you. But one thing I do want to point out is if you remember, and we kind of glossed over this at the very beginning, but now we're going to start to dig into it a little bit. We defined that there are actually two types of stresses. There's normal stress, applied, you know, normal to the plane, but then there's shearing stress, parallel to the plane. Remember that? And we said that shearing stress and shearing strain, let me go back a little bit. 
the button will just do this for me. So. All right, we said that, okay, you know, normal stress and normal strain is all about elongation, but shearing stress and shearing strain is all about an angle change. Remember that? Well, when we look at torsion, specifically torsion of circular shafts, if I look at a little element of that, that shaft before and after, I'm talking about an angle change, okay? So when we're dealing with torsion, we're not talking about normal stresses or normal strains. We're talking about shearing stresses and shearing strains. We're not talking about change in lengths. We're talking about change in angles, okay? So it's something that, that you need to be aware of. The what, what's going to be new and what makes this uh, derivation so intricate is that constant J. And once we figure out J you, and, and you learn how to compute that, you'll see that torsion problems and axially loaded problems, there's not a terrible amount of difference between them. So it's just, you know, the, the mechanics. I think that's about all I have for you all today. I wanted to at least introduce the idea of torsion. We're going to you know, sort of hit the ground running next time. But we're doing really well on time. We're actually well ahead of where I thought I would be uh, by now. So we're, we're doing pretty well. That usually means that I, I want to make sure that you all are, are getting the information necessary. So if I'm ever going too fast, if, you know, I'm losing you, if I'm glossing over stuff, please stop me. Say, what the heck's going on? That's all I got. I will see you all next week. Uh, yes? Do you want, let me pause this. Um, I'm going to forget that.